Hello, Earthlings. My guest today is Mark Sargent. Today we're going to address a topic that not only is one of the greatest conspiracy theories on the Earth, but also happens to be about the Earth. Mark was born in Seattle, Washington. He grew up in South Whidbey Island and founded the Brimstone Fireworks Company when he was in college. He spent three years as a sous chef in a Greek restaurant, won the first computer pinball world tournament in 1994, and was hired by a PC game publisher in Boulder, Colorado the same year. He played computer games for a living until 1997, and he's been in the Boulder technology sector ever since. Mark's not married, he doesn't have kids, so most of his extensive free time is spent unraveling the hidden truths of our civilization and the never-ending search for the meaning of life itself. If you had to pick one single motto, it would be hope for the best, prepare for the worst. A close second is don't regret what you've done, regret what you haven't. Mark, welcome to First Contact Radio. Thank you for being here. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this topic, and I know lots of people are, and the response you've had from it is more than you realized that it would, you'd have. Indeed. And, and my response to it is certainly more than I ever thought I would have in this particular subject, but when the truth is out there, we need to uh, we embrace it, and we know. Agreed. So I became aware of you through your video series, um, The Clues About the Flat Earth, Flat Earth Clues. What prompted you to want to create this, and what is like the the kind of overall essence of what this series is about? Um, <clears throat> initially, the why I created it was uh, I, I had started out looking at other conspiracies, and this was one that I just hadn't looked at. Like most conspiracy people, I hadn't looked at it for the longest time because it's ridiculous, it's ludicrous, and and uh, it is it is the worst conspiracy you'd ever ever want to back. So. Uh, but I eventually said, okay, I'm going to open this box and, and see what's inside. And, you know, for me, there was no doubt. It's like, okay, there's nothing in here. So I'll just, I'll just look through it and, and I'll be done with it very, very quickly. But mm -hmm. as I was looking through it, uh, you know, I started to go down the path of, of the history of how the globe came to be. And I noticed that as I was going through it, <clears throat> that most of our history, you know, for the first 4,500 years of, of who we are, it was it was always uh, you know a flat uh, or flattish enclosed system, and and you know that spans all religions, all cultures. You know there's there's myths and legends going back forever. You know you can find it everywhere. So I thought okay you know that's that's fairly interesting, but you know I, I really wanted to see you know eventually you know I think science takes over you know and they prove it's a globe and and that's that's all there is to it. So you know I start going through the timeline and I realize that uh, about you know 1500 you know mid 1500s. The scientists, you know, through a sort of scientific revolution, start molding the Earth into from a from a flat system, you know, flat and closed system would look like this, mm -hmm. into a globe. And the churches and religions kind of bent with it because, you know, at that point you've got a real division. You, you've got one idea that says, well, it's it's flat, you know, it's an enclosed system. The other says, no, it's a wide open globe system. And the two just couldn't couldn't live together. So the church right. says, okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna go with this. And you know, it's not that much of a stretch for us. Fine, it's a globe. God still created the globe, and uh, we'll move forward with it. But the problem was, was that there was no way to prove it. And you know, so 1500s, you know, they they, they were saying that you know this is this is where we we live. But there was literally no way to prove it. They weren't even remotely close. They were centuries away from from ever proving it. And so, you know, you, you go through the centuries, you know, from 1500 all the way up to about 1900, you know, and then you start getting planes. And then around the middle of the 1950s, when we were doing uh, explorations down in Antarctica, things started changing. And what I mean by that is everybody started acting, the governments, the, uh, the very rich people and the royalty, everybody started acting really, really strange. And so... <clears throat> I started going backwards, you know, working through the timelines, and I realized that as I was going through it, I just found more and more evidence that this isn't where we live, and it was it was it was wrong. And and as I progressed further and further down this down this path, it became more and more apparent to me that this this was just a symbol. This is just an image that they put out there, and the real world looks nothing like it. So that's that's how I started. Okay. Okay, cool. So you put together this series. You have yep. 11 videos, the part of it. Yep. And I thought that your organization was amazing. Thank you. And with, such, with information like this, the key to me is how well information is organized because 
people need to really have things explained to them very thoroughly. Yeah. So in that regard, I thought if we go systematically in the order that you did, did your presentation, sure. that might really be good. So your first one is called Empty Theater. Empty Theater. And that was more of a teaser more than anything else because <clears> – <throat> If you believe in the enclosed system, then there are certain rules you have to follow. And one of which is the space program is absolutely put into to que not just question, but complete doubt at that point. Mm -hmm. And so empty theater really touched on, and then again, it was kind of, you know, easing people into it because I know this is a jarring subject. It was jarring for me. I certainly didn't want to believe it. You know, for people out there that understand, it's, oh, you know, he's, he's nuts. He's crazy. It's like, no, I was looking at this thing. And I was looking at it for nine months and I was going, you know, every time I looked at it, I was going, no, please don't be flat. Please don't be flat. Mm. And, but it kept coming up flat. So right. <clears throat> the first thing I, I threw at people was empty theater, which was the noted absence of Hollywood movies that dealt with the moon missions at all. And it was striking to me how well it was hidden because people don't understand, you know, you, you can ask people, it's like, oh, yeah, you remember that mission about the moon, you know, the, the movie about the moon. And mm -hmm. people will go, oh, yeah, you know, the, their initial reaction is, oh, yeah, 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 there's a movie about the moon. I go, really? What is it? And then they'll start looking back and every movie they reference, every movie they're thinking about is usually a science fiction movie. You know, right. it's, it's Red Planet or it's 2001 A Space Odyssey or it's Mission to Mars or it's something like that. And so I went down and I said, OK, look. This is what we, you know, we've seen so far. Hollywood makes a ton of science fiction movies that go into space, and then a smaller group of movies that deal with uh, uh, sort of a, a pseudo future, you know, like a, like like what could happen in space. Right. But then you deal, you, you start digging into movies like, okay, what about factual accounts? You know, like you know, like the greatest achievement of all time, which is supposedly our our trip to the moon. Where's the movie there? And and, the, and I looked, and I'm a big media guy. I absorb all media, and and I'm a you know a big movie buff. And I realized I was going as I was going through my mind, I was going, and then you know looking up on Wiki and, and looking at all the stuff, I was going, there is no movies. Uh, hmm. The the closest thing we had, you know, if the if the moon missions supposedly ended in 1972, uh, the first movie that was even made wasn't until 1983, uh, and that was called The Right Stuff, which was really just an astronaut recruiting movie. More than anything, it was, uh, you know, it was just, you know, the astronaut training program and it was three hours long, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, at the end of those three hours, uh, you know, they barely even made it into low Earth orbit and there was no sequel. It won a whole bunch of awards, made a ton of money. It was absolutely left wide open to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is losing. Um, it was absolutely uh, left wide open to a sequel, but it didn't happen. So... After that, there wasn't a single uh, movie referencing it until 1995 with Apollo 13, starring you know all big names, and I think it was directed by Ron Howard. And after 1995, that was it. There were no okay. there were no moon, moon movies, and mm -hmm. it, you know it stuck out. You know people don't understand. It's like how, you know why? You know you know you know full well. You you know you being down in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Hollywood makes everything. They make right. they make sequels to to utter crap. And you're right. telling me no one, no one's touching this script. No one could come up with a, a moon landing footage. And the and the reason was, uh, and I and I say it in the clip. It's like, look, because you can't do a moon movie. You cannot right. simulate a moon movie because if you have, the, you know, the actual moon footage, what they're pushing off is the actual moon footage and a real Hollywood movie that it's dead on, then you get that weird blurring of the lines and people will right. go, people will go, well, well, wait, it looks just like the same thing. So how do we know? that's real and that was you know i have no doubt in my mind that is nasa's big thing is like you know we were just not you know if anything even comes down the pike in hollywood along those lines it is it is it is redirected somewhere else right so that was that was empty theater well what we know now is they actually did make a hollywood moon movie back in 1969 and they had one of the greatest directors of all time directed it so stanley kubrick you're, you're absolutely you know, right and, and and then and again there's no coincidence there that he started working on 2001 a space odyssey the greatest space epic of all time uh in 1963 the exact same time that the moon program was firing up you know the rumors that he worked for him they're not rumors he absolutely worked for him and it went bad and he he wrote it he, he got so soured with it that he wrote his entire confession into the shining which was made in 1980 he wrote it in code anyone can look it up the uh the, the documentary is called uh, room 237 it's brilliant mm -hmm. and uh, i have no doubt so we're going to move on now to part two 
And the second part is Bird Wall. So what is Bird Wall all about? Bird Wall was really my point of no return. Uh, Bird Wall covered the exploration of the, the, the parts of the world we hadn't discovered yet. And more specifically, okay. we went down the road of Admiral Richard E. Bird. And okay. he is most known for the hollow earth theory because uh, he explored the North Pole in 1926. And he, but, and, and we're not going to talk about the hollow earth theory because it's, it's everything, all the really interesting stuff when it came to that guy came to the South Pole. So 1928, okay. he was recruited to start doing explorations down the South Pole. And from 1928 until about 1954, he did four big expeditions uh, and I'm going to include Operation High Jump, which we won't go into detail here. But okay. what had happened was he went down there and it was like he was looking for something. And for me, there was little doubt that the authority knew. At the highest level, people knew. You know, if you want to talk about royalty or very rich people or, or, or old governments, people knew at the highest level what the world should have looked like. But unless you have the technology to exploit it, you're not gonna be able to do anything. So eventually you're gonna have to prove it out because after mm -hmm. 20 generations, it really just diminishes into legend. You know, if you, let's say you're the prince of, of Spain, you know, you know, it's like your grandfather is this, this map has been passed down and your father before him. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but we can't go mm -hmm. there. So who cares? So right. they picked a guy uh, named Richard Bird and they sent him down to the South Pole, and he was doing expeditions down there for a long time. And then in 1954, he took a quick break to get ready for his next exped expedition, and he went up to the States, and he started doing interviews on, okay. on television. And he did one for CBS, and it was very, very interesting, and we're lucky to have it. You know, it's on YouTube. You, you can download it. You know, Richard E. Bird. It's a very easy, you know, it's, it's black and white, but it's a very, very telling interview where he goes over the details of his last mission. He was super excited about being back from Antarctica, could, could not say enough about it. And what he really couldn't say enough about, it, yeah, so yes, from a scientific standpoint, it's very, very interesting. Uh, there's a vast um, mass of land bigger than the United States that he hadn't even flown over yet. You know, human eyes literally hadn't seen it. And of course, that was kind of telling for me. It's like, cause that's, that was obviously going to be the first place he headed back down to for the next mission. Right. But, right. but the big thing he talked about was that Antarctica was really just made out of money from a resource standpoint. It mm -hmm. was just a treasure trove. It had everything. It had an entire mountain range made out of coal. Where, where does that happen? Um, right. It had oil, it had uh, minerals, it had uranium and all these things, you know, people were already salivating and getting ready for it. It wasn't just the Americans. The Russians were down there who was trying to rebuild from World War II. They had a very big vested interest in that, which he mentions at the back part of his interview. Um, the Great Britain was down there, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand. They were all down there. Everyone was getting psyched up. And, and best I could figure was what, what was happening was, so say you had the old map and you saw how what the world really looked like and you send down your best guy. And whatever they were sending him down to find, he wasn't finding it. Uh, okay. And he hadn't been finding it for 20, 30 years. And so they finally said, well, uh, let's let's just start making money on this thing. And again, that's Murphy's Law. Because as soon as you say right. that, you know, at least we can get the money out of it. And exactly. as soon as you do that, that's when things go wrong. And so in 1955, he was sent down for one final mission. And I mean one final mission because this is the last mission anyone ever goes down there for. You say, oh, no, they probably had missions in the 70s, 80s, 90s. No, no expeditions publicly ever happened in Antarctica again because they found mm. something super scary. Right. And uh, so they go. he goes down there. In 1955, 1956, called Operation Deep Freeze, an American expedition, and everything seemed to be going well. The expedition ends, but then things start getting super weird around the world. Uh, governments start making these big, big moves and start doing big, big things. And they don't seem like they're connected when you first look at them. But when you start mm -hmm. looking at the timeline, it starts to make sense, but they only, it only makes sense in an enclosed system. So the first thing that happened was after 1956, 1957, Russia and America became really frantic over a rocketry programs. And they okay. started building rockets. And then within a year after they're building their first rockets, they decided to put nuclear weapons on the top of them and start firing them straight up into the air and hmm. detonating, these, detonating these weapons. And they did that starting in 1958. And after the second shot, 
which was uh, the early part of 1958. And you guys can look this up. Uh, just Google high altitude um, nuclear explosions. You'll see it. After that second shot, NASA was founded right away. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. the, all of a sudden you just militarize space. It's like, all right, you know, maybe that maybe that's not connected to anything. And then you keep firing, and then within, I think, nine months later, um, they seal off Antarctica. And by that I mean all the nations abandoned everything simultaneously, all the oil, all the coal, you know, the, coal mm. the, the uranium, the minerals. They abandoned it simultaneously, and they put a treaty in place in 1959 called the Antarctic Treaty. Ten nations signed it then, and they basically made a, a treaty that says no one gets to go down to Antarctica again, mm. period. And any nation that and, and, and had this weird – so and any nation that came on board, so like if you're a nation to become industrialized, you have to sign this treaty. You know, you, you can't even debate it with them. So it's like, well, what about the oil and the coal? No, nope, no, nope, you're signing this. It means you're not going down to Antarctica. Well, how long? Well, forever. And, and, that, and that treaty is not even debatable at this point all the way until to the year 2041. It's ridiculous. It it is you know from our, it is not what we are. It's not what we do. We especially on the American front. You know we are a capitalistic, right. greed filled society. If there's oil, we're gonna get it. It doesn't matter where it is. Mm -hmm. We will start wars to get it. We will go into your national parks. We will do everything. And then there's this Antarctica thing. It's like they won't even petition it. They won't even put anything on mm -hmm. paper. It's like they're told whoever it is at the highest level of the petroleum industry has been told. Don't talk about it. You don't bring it up anywhere. You don't mention it in the press conferences. This is something and, – and I don't even know if they're even told why. They just says, look, it's a mm -hmm. matter of national security. And it's like, well, which, which nation is it a national security thing? Because you had eight different nations, including the, you know, the, the USSR at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. they, and everyone agreed at the same time. When does that happen? When does everybody right. agree to, to leave at the same time? So for, for me, the, the bird – the bird wall, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind because, you know, that they had found the edge of the firmament or, or, or the enclosure or whatever you want it because there was there, – there, they couldn't come up with a story – cover story big enough to, to keep right. people off. You think, well, if it's, if it's just the wall, maybe you can get, put a perimeter, you know, maybe 100 miles out to where you can't see it. No. No, you can't take that chance because let's say you let the oil companies in. The problem there is you let the oil companies, you let the, the mining companies in. Sooner or later, either by accident, either someone's going to stray off course with a helicopter or a plane, or they're right. going to say – they're what they'll probably do is they'll point to that area, and they'll say, hey, we want to explore over there. And then the military says, no, that's ours. You can't go over there. And and, and be just, what are you talking about? Why, why can't we go over there? And so the oil companies would keep pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries, and it would never end. It'd be this 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 tug of war, and the governments and the military decide, you know what, we're not even gonna we're not even gonna address it. We're just gonna keep yeah. them off, and it, because it's bigger than money. Right, and that's bizarre because the moment you someone sets up a boundary. That's a clue for those who are paying attention that there's something that they don't want you to see. Exactly. And this is and this is not like Area 51 where you put up motion sensors and big scary signs saying lethal, right. lethal force authorized because that's just a small part of Nevada. You know, that's just mm -hmm. a small part of a desert. This is literally like shutting off the entire uh, section of South America. You know, it's it's right. that big, and it's like, why would you shut off a piece of land that big? Because you know, it's not a ba you know, it's not a military, ba you know, secret military base of ours. Plus, why mm -hmm. would all countries shut off an area that big? Right. You know, again, this is not people. People don't understand. This is not an American problem. This is a global problem. Right. So. All right. Well, let's take a look at some of this clip of Admiral Byrd on the TV show. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yes. unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. 
And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm -hmm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, Admiral a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker Atka. And it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back. And upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that...? Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, at the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the uh, bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And, uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased there, the strategic importance of places like the... Uh, oh, very much Palma so. Peninsula, was it? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. I've then between there and Cape... Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains it's not covered with snow, enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, 
the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make Joey this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Okay, so the next one, the next part of the video series was map makers, and this is where it starts to address a bit more of what the Earth looks like and ideas that what some of the ancients believed in the maps and, and how the world looked as opposed to what we looked at it right now. Yes. So when I was uh, initially going down this road, uh, map makers I had actually discovered before the bird wall, but but I, I wanted to kind of I wanted to give it its own section, which was I had to find you know what what the consensus was as far as how the world looked from an enclosed point of view. So I was looking mm -hmm. for a flat map, and so yeah, I found the flat Earth map, and it was kind of interesting because you know it had all the the continents clumped in the center, and then you know a big ring of oceans, you know the the southern hemisphere oceans, and then the entire thing was surrounded by a, a giant ring of uh, frozen continent, which we know as Antarctica. I thought mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting, but I was you know looking you know I was looking everywhere for the maps, and I got into the wiki projections list of map projections, which shows okay. just about every map that's ever been proposed on the world. In, you know, not necessarily in chronological order, but there's some interesting stuff there, including the uh, the, the Mercator map that's used in schools. That's you know uh, that there's by the blackboard versus the Gall Peters map, which is the one they're trying to get into schools, and they can't even get that into schools because they're saying mm -hmm. no, it's too much of a shock to shock to people, and we've been teaching this other map for so long. But anyway, I get down to the circular maps and I run into something called the Azimuthal Equidistant map. Okay. And that's a circular map and it looked eerily similar to the flat earth map. Continents grouped in the center, surrounded by the ocean, surrounded by that mm. giant ring that was called Antarctica. So I started comparing the two maps and they were absolutely identical. But one of them was linked uh, as a map that was used by uh, the United States Geological Survey as, as the, you know, the current map of the world. And the, the flat earth map was linked to nothing. That was linked to crazy town. And people, okay. people that believed in that were obviously, you know, t you know, tin, tinfoil hat people. So what was weird was the, the azimuthal map, again, the, the identical map was also used by the UN flag, which was very interesting because why would the UN flag have, you know, from, from, from their standpoint, there was one thing missing because the UN flag doesn't have Antarctica on their map, and the mm -hmm. azimuthal equidistant does. So why didn't why didn't um, the UN flag put the ring of Antarctica around the edge of the map? You know, they they left it out deliberately. Um, not only that, but they replaced it apparently with a series of of large spiky wreaths around the outside. And I think that was one of your in, you know the in your face moments they were like oh yeah by the way you know we know now who who knows at that level you know we'll know but what was also interesting about those both the the un flag and the azimuthal map was they were very very old maps meaning mm -hmm. they were proposed and you can see the link it's like proposed 1000 ad and you're going oh it's got to be a typo and then you see who was proposed by which was a, a persian scientist named al biruni his full name i'm not going to get into it because it's really hard and i might choke and uh it was and he lived about a thousand years ago, and he was a Persian scientist, very disciplined in in lots of different things, and that's the map they're using. So why is the United States government using a Persian scientist's thousand year old map back when we knew the world was flat? Why are they still right. using this? Would, you know, did they leave it on Wiki accidentally? Did somebody just happen mm -hmm. to slip that in there? I don't even know if it was one one of those in your face things, but it was very very intriguing to me. So uh, I, I had to make a note of it because it's the only map out of all those projections that's linked to anybody. You know, you think, oh, this map's okay. linked to, you know, like Spain or, you know, different countries, different organizations. No, everything's blank, 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 blank. United States government, United Nations, blank, 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 blank. So. Hmm. And there, the ancients, for the most part, believed that the earth was flat. There's many references in the book of Genesis. Yeah. Um, throughout the Bible, we have the, uh, the Egyptians at one point, yeah. the Greeks. The Mayans, if we read Zechariah Sitchin's book, yep. um, he's talking about, you know, the Earth was a flat disk with a dome over it. Yeah. So it's not a common theory. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's not a new theory. It's the way it was looked at 
until it was changed. Yeah, for for 4,500 years, the majority of our civilization, that's what we thought the the Earth looked like. It was it was flat. It was enclosed in some sort of dome like structure. What it made, what it's made out of, who knows? But it was definitely enclosed. No one's getting out, and it only changed starting around the 1500s. So it was, you know, and, and then, so yeah, this image that you're looking at has not been around that long and, uh, and was, you know, couldn't could, literally could not be proven until the 1950s when of course, you know, we'll get into it later, which is, uh, if you found out it didn't look like this after you've been handing out these things for 20 generations, mm -hmm. do you tell people? Right. Good question. All right. The next in this series is uh, part four shell beach. What is shell beach? The, the gist of that. Shell Beach kind of delved into things that we've done uh, from a Hollywood standpoint to what we've done to simulate enclosed worlds. Because a lot of people don't understand that there's quite a few enclosed worlds that we've actually covered in cinema. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and because people relate to that, you know, they, they latch on to these things. So I brought on uh, the first thing I talked about was um, Dark City, which there's a reference to Shell Beach in Dark City. And that is uh, Shell, Dark City was an enclosed system that was built but it was very it was it was very small so it was built only the size of a city and the city actually went out to the outer edges so it was this circular city that was enclosed and the people didn't know they lived inside it because all the roads didn't reach the edge and so people right. would drive around in circles and they also altered their memories on a regular basis so they wouldn't catch on to anything but every once in a while someone would wake up and they'd and they'd figure it out but shell beach was something that was supposedly outside the city but it was only a memory Shell Beach didn't exist in real life, but nobody knew that. So the joke was in the movie, it's like, how do you get to Shell Beach? And no matter what mm. train you took, no matter what road you took, you could never quite get there. And so people, well, you, you'd ask people in the movie, it's like, uh, um, so yeah, you've been to Shell Beach, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. Do you remember mm -hmm. how to get there? And they go, wait, how do we? You know, they they wouldn't remember. It was, it was a fragmented thing. Mm. But that's how I started people. And then I went into the movie, which just about anybody that wants to, you know, really get hold of this model, really should look at it, and that's The Truman Show, which was on, I think, in the mid-90s. And it was, you know, The Truman Show, for those of you who haven't missed it, really, it's, you know, one, one of Jim Carrey's best work, but it's also a fantastic example of what an enclosed system can do. Because the system was designed, it was, I don't know, less than 20 miles wide, and it was a single city where you raise a kid from birth into the system, everybody else is actors and extras, and you raise a kid from birth inside the enclosed world, well, he's not going to know he's in the enclosed world. Everybody else knows he's there, uh, but nobody, you know, he doesn't know because why would he? You know, when you when we're young, and that was the whole point of of what we uh, uh, what that video was about was if you're born into the system when we're young, we believe that people are going to tell us the truth. Our parents, our government, uh, you know, anybody, you know, why would people lie to us? But the illusion is so easy to project on kids, which is, again, why this globe was such a great idea. The globe model, it's like, look, you put this into a first grade classroom, they stare at it for 12 years, you don't even have to point at it. Right. People will just go, you know, it's, you know, they just stare at, you know, they feel it. It's like, oh, yeah, they, they totally understand. By the time they're out, you say, oh, yeah, where do you live? Oh, I live here. Why, mm -hmm. why would you ever question that? So the Truman right. Show dug into uh, the aspect of what you could do with the Truman Show model if you made it bigger. And as you made it bigger, I found that once you get at least one generation of people in there, let's say the first generation were actors. Once those mm -hmm. actors have children, if the, if the children don't know, if they don't tell them, then when the parents die, that link, that knowledge is gone. And at that mm. point, the children and their children and every generation after that don't know where they live. Exactly. They think they know where they live, but they don't mm -hmm. actually know. And so when I was building on that, I realized that as you scaled the system up to hundreds of miles and then thousands of miles, the actors can be removed entirely and the maintenance becomes so much easier because everything else happens naturally in the inside. All you have to do is pre protect the perimeter. Uh, you know, you, you, you build in systems to where they think they're turning around on their own, but actually they're turning around because you told, you know, you, you put the system in place. Like it gets too cold out towards the edge. Oh, I'm going to turn back. There's icebergs. I'm going to turn back. Um, I'm getting, it's getting hard to breathe. I'm climbing down the mountain at this point or right. my balloons going up too high and people. And, and I touched on that in the village by M. Night Shyamalan as well, which didn't even need a dome. That's what made that movie right. so brilliant. It's like, look, if you buy a piece of land in a land you know in a wildlife preserve and raise kids there 
they're going to believe anything you tell them. So you could, you know, if you want them to make believe you're they're in the old West, that's exactly what they're going to believe. Why would they believe right. anything different? And the same thing applies here. We believe this because we're born into it and our families right. beforehand. There's no, you know, there's so, there's it's so much history has gone by now that no one would ever, ever question it. You know, 20 generations, is like, it doesn't sound like a long time. It is a long, long time. You know, enough to condition a lot of people to believe something. Yes, exactly. And you got belief and fact, and those two things often run into each other. Agreed. And and we got the uh, something's in the collective consciousness because there's other movies that seem to have the same theme. The, the most recently we got the Signal. Yep. We got the, under the dome. Yep. Under the dome. Uh, the Simpsons, Simpsons movie. Yeah, where the they put the dome over the entire city. And again, don't think these these things are happening by accident. It's Right. You know, I don't like to necessarily throw out the word predictive programming too loosely because it's overused, I think, in the conspiracy world. But for me, you have to, because this this is so big, you can't hide it forever because we all live here. It's like right. hiding something in your own apartment from somebody else. Sooner or later, they're going to run into it. You can't bury it forever. So con contingency plans are already in place. And the more stuff you show with domed or enclosed systems the less shock it will be if something comes about it's so people don't right. so people can get their head around it. it's like oh we're in the truman show right you know they they won't freak out nearly as well They'll still freak out but they won't freak out as much they have a bit of a it's easier to grasp exactly so part five is called status quo and this begins to get into the who was involved with this picture and now we start talking about the major religions and this is where we kind of backtrack to realize that all of the major religions at one point all had a flat earth model. Yes. And then suddenly things changed when science met religion. Exactly. Uh, you, you're, all your major – the big five major religions, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, they all – pretty much shared the same, you know, they may have, you know, gone to war and fought each other, but, you know, at the basic level, they still believed pretty much what the world looked like. And that mm -hmm. was, you know, a, a flattish uh, system with an enclosure that, you know, people, people can't get out of. And for me, when I got into status quo, I was looking at what each of the religions wanted and why you would want to hide it from them. Uh, because, you know, when it comes to the authority, and by that I mean governments, the super rich and, and royalty, they've got a vested interest in keeping the world at a certain at a certain pace and a certain type of, of, of um, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And so what happens here is this. So imagine all those religions, and every one of them is looking for a supernatural uh, object. They're looking for an artifact that can solidify their religions. Every, every religion wants something that will put them on top. You know, whether it be the Holy Grail, whether it be the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I can't remember what the, the, the Buddhism and Hinduism ones are, but they're pretty good. But everyone's looking for it. And mm -hmm. if they can find it, you know, they will hold on to it and that will be, you know, their their new point of focus. So imagine if you were out on Antarctica and you found, you know, the firmament. You know, something something in it, fine. If they want to call it a wall or a barrier, you know, even if it was a force field, it doesn't matter because all the religions would say the same thing. This is obviously the enclosure, therefore it is part of our religion <clears throat> and we have a vested interest in it. So imagine if all the religions at the same time in the world got the same artifact at the same time. Mm. There would be a huge shift right. in, in how people thought. And from a scientific standpoint, because remember the exploration teams, they're science-based. You know, remember mm -hmm. what Bird said, he goes, it's a great thing for science, Antarctica. So right. you've got all these scientists down there in Antarctica and military and government and the rich people that are backing them. And all of a sudden, you know, you find this thing. Well, it's it's a tough call because you're going to be firing a lot of your people if this happens. You're going to be disbanding a lot of the people that are on there in the ice with you. So it's this mm -hmm. weird self-preservation thing. It's like, okay, all these scientists, yeah, they won't have jobs anymore. All these guys over here, you know, they won't, you know, have jobs anymore. And so the decision was made at that point to hide it because they knew if they didn't, there would be a potential backlash. And I'm going to use the Archer reference. They were afraid of a revenge rampage from religion because religion has been slapped around for a long time on this. You know, science has had their way, but if religion all of a sudden came back and said, Oh, by the way, the firmament, we got dibs on that. We had this long before you came up with the word force field. 
then you know then science they're going to be backpedaling and and they didn't want to do right. it so right and just uh, as a point of reference because you, you mentioned the word firmament firmament is what is described as this dome that is over us yes and the the book of Genesis talks about the firmament that separates the waters from above as from the waters from below. Yeah. So yeah. as we're talking about that, we're talking about some sort of closure yeah. that is a dome-like structure. Yeah, Genesis 1, by the way. And it's not even like, you know, it's not like one of those later books in the Bible. This isn't New right. Testament. This isn't, back, you know, the back part of the, the Old Testament. This is the first book, you know, mm -hmm. that talks about this. So it's, you know, for again, for them, religion, oh, they haven't forgotten this. Not by a long shot. And right. uh, they they will absolutely break that that verse out, and they will put it on billboards everywhere if if this comes out. Right. Very good. So part six of your series is called Depth of Perception, where it gets into a bit more description of what is this closed model, yep. and why wouldn't anybody bother to go out up or down what are the restrictions that kind of keeping them in place yeah yeah i i summarized and then i got into geologic systems but I, what i did was i said okay let's look what we know so far and if you were going to build a flat model there are certain systems you would put in place that would seem like natural systems but they're really more deterrents to keep people away from the edge but it's a soft deterrent it's a pushback so mm -hmm. for example uh you know um uh, first thing you would do, you know, again, the, I, I love this little thing where you add three percent salt solution to the to the oceans. That's that's mm. that's brilliant because what it does is there is you can't drink the water you're sailing on. So if you're doing explorations, you know, a lot of those exploration voyages were based on how much fresh water you had on board. And mm. if you could just keep replenishing that, you just you'd go so much further. I mean, that reduces exploration right. by ninety five percent. You reduce the temperature on a flat model as you get further and further to the outer edge to the point where salt water freezes at about 15 degrees and then you start seeing icebergs that'll deter wooden ships uh, everything on the outside and then if you actually made it to the outer edge you run into Antarctica and that goes up two miles almost straight mm -hmm. up and then it stays at two miles so you're at 10,000 feet and a lot of people are going to get altitude sickness at that at that sort of thing uh, sort of range and then even if you did get up there and you started trudging across the ice there's no plant life there's no animals to eat <laughs> there's no anything so there's so many deterrents on the outer edge this is just layers and layers of things to keep you out there or, I'm sorry to keep you off the ice and the upper part is easier. One, because you need technology to do it. Uh, you right. couldn't even get balloons. Balloons to carry people weren't even invented until 1760, which means, you know, that's thousands of years worth of you didn't, stuff you didn't even have to worry about. Uh, and then even if you did go up there, you, you get less and less oxygen and the temperature drops off. So you don't mm -hmm. have to deal with oceans, but it's getting super cold and uh, you're not breathing so well. <laughs> so right. you're not going to be doing much there. Um, between those two mechanisms, that keeps you from going out to the edge or going up too high. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I covered the 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 thing the thing I I didn't talk about at that point uh, until I dealt with this clue was the geologic systems <clears throat> because sooner or later because everybody knows how to dig they're going to dig really deep you know that's people right. people love digging holes for some reason and they're going to dig and they're you know how far can you dig on a flat model. Because eventually, you know, that old joke, you dig your way to China, right? Well, no, right. you can't dig your way to China. As a matter of fact, you can't dig your way very far, turns out, at all. Because once you dig down to a point of about eight miles, it doesn't matter what you're using. If you're using a high-speed uh, alloy drill bit, uh, it starts turning to clay because of the heat. The heat just starts, starts getting warmer and warmer and uh, to the point where the drill bits fail. So nobody's drilled below eight miles anywhere in the world, you know, unless you're talking about classified military, but that's a whole other thing. Um and that's when the question is like, okay, well, we know that because there's molten rock, you know, there's lava underneath us. And, you know, we know what the core of the earth looks like. It's like, really? You, sh you sure you know what the core of the earth looks like? Because if you've only drilled down eight miles, you don't know anything. And, the, right. and science is the first person to say, oh, we're using seismographs. We're using all sorts of sonar and ra underground radar. We're doing all sorts of stuff. Do you know what it looks like? Well, we're, we're kind of extrapolating. So, uh, when it comes to the molten rock, they said, well, it's it's probably a natural process. No, no, it's not a natural process. You don't have to, in a structure this size, if it's 8,000 miles across, and you've already built systems to keep, you know, natural systems, which work perfectly to keep people off the edge or up the up top, you're really going to leave something to chance on the lower section? No, no, right. the, the lava system is artificial from, from the beginning, and there is no doubt in my mind that that everything is controlled, including that. 
Right. As you're talking, the, the scene that's popping in my head is that scene in They Live where they beam underground and then you see this whole structure and then he actually goes out to like a platform that's out looking space. Sure. And it's like, okay, what, so what's going on down there? There's like, because if you have a, a system where the top is a dome and this is where people are living, you got to have some sort of mechanism underneath that perhaps is powering this system, keeping it going. Exactly. And so, entire civilizations could live underground, you know, that, and, and they would absolutely make sure that we didn't discover them because if you're on the ground, that's the easiest people to get to. You know, it's like, it's like right. if once we found, if we found out there was a civilization underground, people would be relentless because digging is easy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I try to tell people when they, when they bring up certain geologic systems or, or anything that, you know, it's like, well, it's obvious proves the globe. It's like, look, if you build a structure that big, if you have the technology to build a structure that big and that complex, is there anything, is there anything you can't do? Because if you can next like, well, they can't, obviously can't do that. It's like, well, then you're kidding yourself because a structure, just, just the, the raw structure itself is, mm -hmm. is such a huge accomplishment that, uh, it's. It's almost limitless what what can be done here. Remember in uh, what was it? Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> they were going through and they were creating the world. Yeah, that was that's a wonderful those scenes when they're building the worlds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, granted, they were building globes, but still, you know that yeah, uh, planetary technology at that scale is uh, again you don't have to build the whole planet. That's the best part. Right. All you have to do is fake it. If everyone believes it's a planet, then it's working. You know right. everything. You know. Now, in regards to um, one of the questions that people often ask is, well, what about the curvature of the Earth? Can't you go so high and you get to a mountaintop and you look and you should see the curvature of the Earth? So, yes, yeah, sh show, does... show me the curvature of the Earth. Show me a picture that doesn't use a fisheye lens. Show me something. Uh, the curvature of the Earth. Now, there may be a slight curve when it comes to the, <clears throat> at least in my model, because I think there has to be a little bit of a slope near the North Pole. Um, mm -hmm. But the rest of it, but it's not, it's not this, it's not this drastic, you know, uh, huge curve, you know, look, check out the videos. There's lots of videos where people send up weather balloons and mm -hmm. they don't show a curve. And the ones that do show a curve are generally using a fisheye lens. It's a very old, it's not even a camera trick. It's just a camera lens, which people use to give, you know, better panoramic shots. The Red Bull right. one is a perfect example. And don't think, don't think that that thing didn't get a lot of hits and was pushed out there you know, on accident, you know, everything right. that shows the curvature, anything that deliberately goes out of their way to show the curvature of the earth is being done to just keep reinforcing this on you because people, it's, right. people are starting to forget it. They're starting to start yep. to see past it. it the, and it's a good illusion. Remember, we, you know, we're, we're suckers for, for magic tricks. You know, we, we mm -hmm. believe a lot of that stuff or, and where we want to believe that's the, you know, this suspension of disbelief that's really kicking in here. Because right. because we want to, since we want to believe this, we will see this. You know, yep. we will not see the obvious. Remember what Stick says. Just remember, it's a grand illusion. Nice, good reference. The next one in order was video number seven, which is called the Long Haul. But also, there's a video number nine, which is called the Magic Show, and these two kind of go together. Yes. So, um, on a if you're if you're building a flat system if you if you finally get your head around it and you're saying okay it's enclosed like the Truman Show then there are three real basic rules that cannot be broken they they can be hidden but they cannot be broken uh, the first mm -hmm. rule of course is that the space program cannot cannot be exist in real life it it cannot everything you see in the space program is utterly a sham and in my opinion not even that good you're not spending that much money on it it's like look get some more funding because it's awful uh two you cannot take a picture of the earth from space uh, because in an enclosed system you wouldn't be able to get up high enough and that is also true <clears throat> the um people don't don't uh don't realize you know if, if, you know for those you know i'm a little older which is uh to, you know, 15 years ago, when you looked at, you did an internet search, an image search for the Earth from space, you literally got one, you know, one picture. And that was a picture from supposedly 1969 or 68, depending on what you believe the, the, the date stamp to be. It's like, it was 2000. Why in the world are you using a picture from the 60s, you know, for your, your picture of the Earth? Like, I, it was stunning to me. And every picture you see now, when you're looking at the Earth, if you do a Google search, you know, cl click on images, they're all composites. And they'll admit that they're composites. That's the part that kills me. But there's so many of them, and they're so much prettier than the original image that they released. That's like, okay, mm -hmm. people just go with that. They don't understand 
that it's not, re you know, they're all composites. They're not real shots. Th and that question has to be asked. It's like, okay, why aren't you taking pictures of the earth from space? But the third thing, the third rule, which you can actually get, you know, it's more down to earth, so to speak, mm -hmm. is the flight routes. And that is, if it's a flat map, if you're on a globe, you can take shortcuts. Uh, like, for example, uh, the perfect example here is on a globe, you have Australia in the southern hemisphere and you have South America on the southern hemisphere. And I'm talk talking about the north part, you know, the, the drug dealing part, the, the, the southern part. And if you're flying from Australia to South America, it's about 7,400 miles. It crosses the South Pacific Ocean. It's easy. It's a straight shot. Not a big deal at all. It's 12 hours, right? Should be 12 hours. But on a flat map, this route doesn't look like that because if it's squished, that ocean then becomes bigger and it has a weird bow to it because it's pushed out to the side. So that 7,400 miles, if you're crossing the ocean, becomes a lot longer. It becomes more than 10,000 miles. Mm. And if that's the case, then how, what do you, what do you do? And if that was the case, then and again, it's easy to prove is those planes won't be going those routes because you're not going to take a 10,000 mile flight around the ocean because it's going to screw everybody. It's like, why is the flight taking right. so long? Um, Plus the GPS is going to be look like it'll make it seem like it's the planes going way, way slower. So the only way you can get the, to, to where you need to go is you have to cut it. You have to make a route that doesn't make any sense because on a flat map, you have to cut straight across the map. And on a globe, that would be the equivalent of going from Australia, cutting across Los Angeles or San Francisco, and then coming back down to South America. It doesn't make it. Why, why in the world would you do this if, if it was, you know, if it was a globe, right. but that's what they're doing. And so you do it in two ways. One, you make connections. And mm -hmm. by that, I mean, you create connections that take you places <coughs> that you wouldn't normally go. And you do that to confuse people. You, you give big layovers. I mean, people, look it up. Go from Buenos Aires to uh, Sydney, Australia, and see how many connections you got. See how long it takes. Should be a 12-hour flight. I've seen flight connections that run 50-plus hours, 52 mm. hours. That's three days. Mm. You know, you're pushing right. on the third day. Why would you ever do that? Right. But on a flat map, it works out perfectly. A flat map, that's exactly the route you would take. You would go from Australia, you'd cut near America, and then you'd go down. And people say, well, wouldn't people notice flying over America? Well, not if you flew at night, and not if people weren't looking out the window. And people look right. out the window, honestly, when I did domestic flights inside the, you know, inside the country, I had no idea what state I was flying over. Or, you know, right. it, what body of water. If I crossed a body of water, I'd be going, I have no idea where I am. Plus, mm -hmm. the GPS system, which we're getting into, the GPS system will tell you what it wants you to see. And the GPS system was designed by the United States military, Department of Defense, and in my opinion, the GPS system, real or not, because if there's no satellites, then GPS system isn't even what they say it is. But mm -hmm. real or not, it's going to tell you, it's going to project the image you want, or they want to see. So here's the thing. So I'm watching these flights, and this all get into so the first thing is connections and there'll be tons and tons of connections if you're doing anything in the southern hemisphere 95 percent of the flights are connections however there were people that were bugging me and saying look there's some non-stops and they don't make any sense because you they could see the booking it's like well it's obviously santiago chile to auckland new zealand well, and the flight time looks right the the duration looks right you know explain that you know you're, you the flatter thing's blown up and i was going no it's not they, because you can't fake it if it's the, because the rule cannot be broken. That's the best. Okay. That's what I love about the flat model. And that is if it works, there's only certain things they can do there. You cannot break the rules. You can't teleport anywhere. So <clears throat> what I did was I started watching the Southern hemisphere, everything below the, the equator on a GPS system, a real time GPS system called planefinder.net. Now you can go to flight tracker 24 or plane tracker, or the, you know, there's a whole bunch, but it doesn't really matter because they're all getting their data from the same system. And that's the United States government, which is the GPS system. And I was starting to watch flights over the Southern hemisphere mm -hmm. and they're easy to spot. You know, you, I should be able to see a red plane, you know, going over the, the water, especially in the South Pacific. And I was staring at it for, you know, one day, two days, four days, and I realized there was no planes flying over the oceans. And mm. I was going, okay, why, why, why is that? Why, how is that even possible? You, because know, even if you had a connection, eventually you've got to get across the ocean, yeah, right? Was... You got to fake it. And so I'm going, wait, wait, where are all the planes? There's no planes over any of the oceans down there. South Atlantic, South Pacific, uh, Indian Ocean. There's nothing there. Mm. Uh, so where, where are the planes? And 
I start staring at them, and then I realize that the planes aren't making it over the oceans because they're being erased from the GPS mm -hmm. system. So I started following it because the easiest one is to follow all the planes that are in Brazil because Brazil has a lot of flights and it's, it's a big country, a lot of people. And there was some flights going from Brazil to, to Africa over the South Atlantic, which should be a pretty, pretty short, short jog. And when they got over about 150, 200 miles out, they'd vanish. Mm. And all the planes started vanishing. And that's when I, once I saw, you know, I didn't have to watch that very long. It only took me a couple hours before I was going, so that's how you would do it. Because you can't, if you can't show the routes, then you hide the routes. So what the GPS system, is, in my opinion, was even designed to do was to mask where the flight, how the flights were actually getting from point A to point B. And so what they would do is, you know, like the Santiago Chile flight, you know, the flight. Yeah, you could you know, people say, well, they, that, you know, that you got nonstops. It's like, fine, show me how they got there, because I can guarantee you they're not going across the ocean because they're starting to fly and then they blink out. And then an hour before the uh, you know, they land, they blink back in and then they land. It's like, well, it's, it's magic. It's it's a miracle. Right. You know, there's there's that's go figure. You know, the plane disappeared. Nobody knew where it mm -hmm. was. And now it's and now it's going to land in its exact spot. And they say, well, that that means that the flight actually happened. I go, yeah, the flight happened. You, in fact, people are saying you should go down on these flights. I'm just going, even if I was on the flight, I couldn't prove anything because I couldn't tell you how I got there. Right. So, and if I was flying at night, then I would be totally screwed. It'd be a waste of money. So their 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 option was they figured we'll just kill all the flights in the southern hemisphere off the radar off the gps system therefore if it's out of sight out of mind nobody looks for them and nobody talks about them and mm. it's a, it's 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 a great it's a it's it's overkill but that's what they do you know and, and up until now it's worked but uh, and so we have the same military industrial complex yeah. who made um, Antarctica, the interior of Antarctica, off limits, yeah. is the same one who's designed this GPS system yep. that we're following. Okay. Now, on a flat Earth model, where do the hemispheres come in and the magnetic north and magnetic south? How do we look at those things? On a flat model, you got to remember that the southern hemisphere it gets pushed out. So the, the northern hemisphere stays pretty much the same like it would. You know, if, if, okay. you, squi if you squished, if this thing was squishable, the, the northern hemisphere would stay where it is, but the southern hemisphere gets flattened out, you know, on the outside of it. So okay. the southern hemisphere gets stretched, um, stretched in the outer ring. So instead of a northern okay. hemisphere, you really have an inner ring and an outer ring. Uh, and most of the continents are on the northern hemisphere anyway, so it's okay. But when it comes to magnetic north and magnetic south, that really doesn't change much. You make put a magnetic field where the North Pole is, and then the entire outer ring is the is the South, you know, magnetic. You know, you use a weaker field there, and the compasses still work out perfectly fine. Okay, and we know magnets can can do that. They can radiate out, so it's going from here and it's radiating sure. outward. Sure. Plus, and then plus again, if it's a if it's a closed system, magnetism is you can do all sorts of fun things there. If, if right. you wanted to, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out what what's going on in the in the uh, Bermuda Triangle. If that's some sort of error, or if it's deliberate, because hmm. uh, there's still some weird stuff happening there. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Now we're going to get into uh, video number eight, which we start to look at a bit more of a different aspect of the implications of this and how we as those down here in this model, in this in this Earth, how we're interpreting and looking at this. Yeah. So number eight was creative force, and that was really done as more of a motivational thing for people because uh, by the time I got into eight, there were people, obviously people were definitely buying into the model, but they were saying that, look, you just got rid of the universe. <laughs> you know, you just, mm -hmm. you just took the inner universe from an infinite place where we were just this tiny little thing to now a one-room apartment. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, and now they've got, you know, small world syndrome. It's like, look, it's still a very big world, you know, and you weren't going into space anyway. So fine. You know, it's like, right. you know, so, so it's not infinite space, but you weren't going there. So I don't think it was that bad. But what I tried to do was give them a perspective on uh, the good things of, of this world and and why, you know, an example of a previous enclosed system and then what we might, you know, someone might build this enclosed system for. And 
I started out with my take on, and I, even though I didn't mention it by name, I figured people would pick up on it, uh, which was the Tower of Babel story, and uh, which went into, uh, you know, for those of you who don't follow, you know, biblical stuff, uh, the Tower of Babel was a, a story of a civilization that was so powerful and so ambitious that they started to build a tower that they said could reach the heavens, which always bugged me even in Sunday school kind of bugged me because it's like okay mm -hmm. where are you where are you going you know if it's on a globe you're not going anywhere so mm -hmm. but on an enclosed model you know exactly where you're going you're you're, right. you're going to the ceiling in fact you even know how high you have to you have to build this thing and I think that's exactly what they were trying to do was 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 see if they could make it and by that point you know there was you know people have said well you know isn't that kind of sad they pressed the reset button and but I said they look they didn't kill everybody they just you know divide the languages and said look this this the uh, that particular civilization was too good at what they were doing. They were too focused. They were too single-minded, uh, and they apparently were were quite quite arrogant <laughs> on top of it. Right. So, and then I went into, again, just kind of to to give people inspiration. I went into what I found, you know, as far as an enclosed system. Even though this world has a lot of of pain and suffering and ugliness to it, there is still a lot of uh, of, of indiv individual beauty that we that we create most la you know most notably from the arts, and the disciplines mm -hmm. in the arts and all the things we make. And I tried to explain to people, look, everybody's a part of it. Um, yes, you know, there, there's certain people that paint and sculpt and do all these things, but every they are influenced by other people. And there's for every one of them, there's all sorts of people that have dreams and everything's just stuck in their head, and they and they can't get it out for whatever reason. Uh, and it was, uh, it, for me, it was very inspiring to, to make because, uh, when I, again, when I woke up, when, when thinking about it, I, I started going down the narrative in my head. And by the time I got to the, you know, the point where I was really, really boosting people, you know, up and saying, look, you know, we're, we've all got, uh, you know, very, very special qualities and creative qualities. I started to get, you know, kind of misty. And I said, mm -hmm. I said, I, I knew that I was like, I, I absolutely am doing this one. You know, people may think it's cheesy, but the response I've gotten has been has been wonderful from it. Right. Well, Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and we are merely players. Indeed. Yeah. It was the time when I really started uh, watching these and paying more attention was around the time of the Oscars. And I had just watched everything. And then I was sit watching the Oscars. And what I noticed stuck out because I saw a flat stage with a, a dome over it, and all these lights looked like planets and stars, and it got me thinking, wait a minute, this sounds and looks a lot like what I was just hearing described in this flat earth model, and then I started thinking about what Shakespeare said, and thought, wait a minute, there's something here to this that, you know, we kind of know, but we're kind of not afraid, or too afraid to touch yeah. it. Yeah, you wonder if, uh, from a creative standpoint, if there's creative influences that are they're subconsciously doing this. You know that that they're being drawn to it. You know why? Yeah, why do we have so many stages? You know why are all stages like that? You know the flat mm -hmm. thing with the enclosed dome and and uh, yeah, it, it, I try to stay positive and and that's that's the that's I really love that that aspect of us. I mean, it'd be uh, interesting to find out that you know all around this earth, outside of the dome, we've got just seats and someone's selling tickets and there's people coming into the theater and they're watching and they're just seeing what's going on. That, the show down that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. I, that would be a, that'd be a happy ending. I'd, I'd, I'd buy a ticket mm -hmm. for. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to the next video, which is very significant. It's called hiding God in which God and the nature of who the creators are is kind of kept from everybody, which is really not very nice. <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, the um, Hiding God, I initially started out as a, uh, a call out, you know, because people are always looking for, you know, what to do next. You know, what, mm -hmm. what are we doing in, 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 in the conspiracy world? You know, it's, it's always this loose end that nobody seems to touch. It's like, well, what do we what do we do now? You know, now that we believe in this model, it's like, well, you know, one, you, you do what you feel like doing, what your what your gut tells you. Um, if it was me, what I would do is I would contact – first thing I would do is, you know, because there's rules, you know, certain things that you can you can catch people without using the word flat earth, which you know, mm -hmm. usually gets you thrown out of the building. Uh, the first thing I would do is contact uh, your local state or federal representatives and tell them that, look, uh, my family flies every once in a while in the southern hemisphere, and I want to know why the GPS safety net – you know that we did. You know the American government designed, and it should be all-encompassing. Remember, GPS stands right. for Global Positioning System, not regional, not partial. Uh, why is oh. it? Why is it turned off below the equator? Why? Why, when I flow over the ocean, 
does um am, you know am i at risk am i in danger that's a point of debate the um the second part is uh, appealing to the the corporate greed of, uh, of especially this country but you know any oil companies or <clears throat> or mineral companies which is Look, everybody knows that the oil companies and the mineral companies can get in just about anywhere. They have unlimited resources for development. Mm -hmm. And yet they have, you know, and there's all this money sitting under, you know, on, on Antarctica, you know, millions of square miles of, of resources just right. waiting to be taken. And you guys can't go get it. And I want to know why. Right. You know, you know, people should be asking that. Look, if you work in the oil industry, the petroleum industry, this should be a primary thing. And and yeah, you, you may not get anywhere. People may say, oh yeah, it's a question of national security. But I'd come back and say, wh which 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 nation? Because apparently nobody owns Antarctica. You know, it's the only piece of it, of real estate in the world. Nobody owns it. So if nobody owns it, then who's telling you you can't go there? Right. right? And and again, if you're the oil company, you've got briefcases, you've got trucks full of money, and you can't get in there. I'm not mm -hmm. buying it. Not buying it right. a second. And then the last thing was uh, appealing to the churches because. If you were going into, you know, if let's say, you know, back in 1955, 1956, you find the edge, you find the firmament, you know, you find the big handprint of God right there. And let's call it what it is. You know, if 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 it's built, you know, if, it, if it's a structure, if it was created, then creator, creation, God, you know, I, you're not gonna be able to dodge that forever. Anyone out there say, well, it's an alien force field. Fine, it's an alien force field, but it's still closer closer to God right. than than anything else you've seen. And it's and someone built it. Yeah, somebody built it. And if that's the case, then a decision was made 50, 60 years ago to hide that from mm -hmm. the church. Uh, and that probably wasn't the best move in the world because right. when it does, you know, if and when this thing does get revealed, there is a chance, you know, that there's going to be some backlash. And I talk about that. And we'll, we'll talk about this, you know, in, in the next one. It's like there should be a temperament as far as the backlash. But every church has a vested interest in this. And that mm -hmm. is if you have faith, every, everybody that has faith, everybody that has a, a, a holy book, they want to know, you know, not just the meaning of life, but, you know, they want to have confirmation of some sort of creator. And if that... Mm -hmm is literally something that they can find if they could walk up to it and bang on it with their hand they right. they will absolutely do it if if you know people would would have pilgrimages you know they would go out to the ice with cold weather gear right. i guarantee it you know and uh and if that's hidden well then then somebody should bring it up and there's right. there's a big there's a lot of religious people out there that uh i think have a have a right to know and the next one the last one of the series number 11 is Souls in the System. So. Souls in the System was my attempt, and I think a pretty good one, to show people, you know, because people kept asking, well, you know, if there's an enclosure and we find out about it, aren't bad things going to happen? You know, we're going to burn cities down and do all these awful things. And initially, you know, by the when I was doing number five, I, I thought, eh, there's a chance, you know, there could be a knee jerk reaction. People could run through the streets screaming, absolutely. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought that if it was enclosed, the enclosure itself would change the tone of people. And to try to, to try to buffer people into that idea, what I used was I referenced, and it was an odd reference, but it, but I but it's I think it worked. Was I used a 2004 documentary uh, called Astronauts Gone Wild, mm -hmm. and. It's an interesting little documentary that a lot of people don't know, and I don't. Again, I don't recommend people go watch it because the whole premise was uh, the reporter in question uh, set up these fake interviews where they he really tried to trip up the astronauts in the little details. You know, he had all these lists mm -hmm. of things he was going to go over, but what he really did was, you know, he brought out, you know, a Bible, <laughs> and he said, you know, put your hand on it and tell me you didn't, uh, or tell me you went, you actually flew to the moon. And and you're thinking, well, okay, well, the, the, how how well is that going to go? Because it's like, look, look, people commit perjury all the time, and these astronauts have been, you know, part of the deception for decades. So what would mm -hmm. it matter, right? Well, that was the funny thing because the astronauts wouldn't put their hand on the Bible and say they went to the moon. And and actually, in reality, it was probably the first time anyone had ever asked them that over all those years. Because why right. why would anyone ever ask? It? It's a it's a it's a weird question, but they wouldn't. Mm -hmm put their hand on. In fact, most of them wouldn't even touch it. It was like this thing was radioactive. And I thought mm -hmm. that was really strange because from 
even an objective point of view, I was, I was going, well, even if they were, you know, super devout Christians, you know, one, the odds say that not all these astronauts, you know, plus they were scientifically trained. It's like, why, why would they be so, what were they afraid of? What, what, you know, were, were they afraid of, you know, were they afraid of God? Is that, you know, what you really, you're not going to swear on the Bible because remember this wasn't court. So if it's mm -hmm. not court, there's no penalty. So fine. you lie. You lie on that guy. What would it make any difference? And then it just sort of crept up on me where I was thinking, you know, these are the guys that were one of the few groups of, of astronauts and NASA people who are probably told it's like, look, mm -hmm. you got to go fake it. Here's why you got to go fake it. It's a matter of national security. It's a national a matter of world security and you got to fake it. But in telling them that what you were basically telling them was, is that it was built. And if it was mm -hmm. built, it was created. And if it was created, well, are you going to put your hand on something and lie deliberately? And, you know, knowing mm -hmm. that it's like that basically there's, there's this fear of retribution and it may not even be a logical fear, but you're not going to roll those dice. And what, what I'm saying is at that point, it's almost like there's a scorecard involved. You know, it's, it's that Santa naughty and nice thing. Naughty and nice right. doesn't mean anything to children unless you see Santa Claus. As soon as you right. see him for real, you know, if he's in front of the fireplace, naughty and nice takes on a whole nother meaning. So, th it so these guys were like going, yeah, I'm not going to lie. No, I'm not going to do anything. They're just not going to do anything. And so then it just kind of, kind of hit me. It's like, you know what? If that's those guys, and granted, you know, those are, you know, fairly upstanding guys from what, what we're told. But imagine what the general population would do. Because, you mm -hmm. know, with the general population, uh, um, you know, would you would you go beat somebody up? You know, would you steal? You know, would you steal? Would you would you would you murder? You know, would you right. dare roll those dice? Even though, you know, there's no there's no there's no. Uh, there's nothing. They're not beaming. They don't, they don't print everything up top. It's like, oh, hey, here's 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 the the general guidelines. Every religion, of course, has them, but mm -hmm. but and those are also sinking in your head as well. But the point is, is that everybody knew at the same time where we were. I mean, wars would end I, I, right away. You know, you're you're fighting another guy. You know, a whole bunch of guys. You know, you're exchanging cannon fire. Why, why, right. why, why would you ever do that again? Uh, you know, why would you do anything malicious towards any anybody? So a lot of the bad things would be tempered, and people say, "Well, you know, that's restrictive. You know, that's that's Big Brother. That's the ultimate, you know, man looking over your shoulder." And it's like, well, no. What it is is a reminder that you're not alone, and right. and you're accountable for your actions. And really, why were you going to do those bad things in the first place? You know, it's, it's which is why I put in the red light example. It's like uh, mm -hmm. it's like, look, everyone's run a red light. That's not even the question. But as soon as you know that they have installed a camera on that intersection, you're not running the red light anymore. Why not? Right. Because you're not supposed to run red lights, and it's a bad idea. Right. It's it's unsafe. There's bad things that can happen when you run red lights. And if it was a giant red light camera on this place. Uh, people, right. you know, again, people can still have fun and do great things, you know, but it stops a lot of the negative reinforcement that we pass on to, to people, you know, you, you know, it's, it's, again, there's, you know, people of course will fight and do things, but I think from an objective standpoint, so much good and so much positive uh, energy would be thrown back into our world that collectively, I think we'd, we'd look around and say, you know what, you know, we should have never been doing this stuff in the first place. Right. So. And I and I think people are, are ready for that change because you hear so much talk of out in the world. People are waking up there. They, they see that there is this seems to be an agenda to remove God from things. And I think that's irritating people enough now to understand that that can't happen because it throws everything out of balance when you you pull divinity out of the mix. Agreed. So. So. As I understand it, as kind of a, a little wrap up of what I understand here, for thousands of years, the ancients believed that the world was flat. Yep. And somewhere around the medieval times, Copernicus posed the idea that it was a globe, even though they had nothing to prove yep. it. And so we went forward from that point with this assumption that the world was, was round yep. until it got to the point where – Admiral Byrd in the 50s started discovering and exploring Antarctica, and it's believed that they found something of great value there that was going to provide the world with years worth of resources 
There were many countries that were involved with this process to help feed the world with these resources. Yep. And then suddenly, for no reason at all, they just stopped. And Antarctica was made off limits by the military industrial complex, who was the same one who created the GPS system and, and shows us the directions of where things go. Yeah. And so now here we are at a time where it's somewhat taboo to look at these subjects because we've been conditioned not to look at these subjects. Yeah. But somewhere in our collective and conscious, we, we understand something's going on because we see this theme popping up in movies all the time. And we seem to understand that there's something more out there, which brings us to where we're at. And the questions that are asked, people want to know what's the meaning of life. And if we really address this issue, yeah. it seems like it would really address that question. The meaning of life is much bigger than any of us could possibly imagine. And that would certainly solve that question about the creator because now we'd all be questioning who made this structure because it certainly wasn't man. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, well, I never thought I would uh, <laughs> find myself being a flat earther, but uh, here I am. Good for you. Here I am. So any, uh, any final thoughts or... Uh, you know, just you, for those out there, and I know, you know, again, there's going to be skeptics, but mm. just try to get your head around it for the smallest fraction, six, give it 60 seconds. And mm -hmm. if you still, if you, you still think it's absolutely impossible, then again, you know, ask the question yourself. It's like, how do you know? How right. do you know? Cause right. you know, right? Exactly, because we've we've got NASA the only source that we are shown, and NASA we know has faked so many things. The National Association of Space Actors, yeah. they just fake things, and we believe them and go on with our lives because we can't be bothered. We're too busy. Yeah. We have to work. We have to go to this. We have to do that. Yeah. If and, if uh, you don't have the picture, if the picture isn't taken, you know, in the late '60s, how do you prove this? Right. How do you do it? It's a big story, and uh, hopefully more people are going to really kind of explore this and use their critical thinking, which is so important. And, you know, it sounds like from the response you're getting that that's already starting to happen. Yeah, everything's been really, really positive. And again, that's that alone is shocking to me. I thought I would get hate mail. I have still yet to get a single debunker that is mm. that has gotten on me either by the phone or email because I put my phone in email and everything, you know, my home address is on there. You can drive to my house. Yeah. And no one has said, this is why it's a globe. Here's the proof. You're wrong. Shut up. No one's ever said that. And right. granted, it has not been out that long, but you would think, given that I covered so many different topics, that mm -hmm. someone would take something. And the closest right. I ever got was the uh, the long haul, number seven, where people were saying, oh, well, there's nonstop flights, so you must be wrong. And then I said, oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Here's what I think of your nonstop flights. They don't exist, you know, or they, they right. exist, but they're, they're, they're vanished. So yeah, somebody find some, come at me. Yeah. Right here. And we see examples, you know, when we see, hear about planes disappearing, it kind of confirms that there's something in place that can make a plane disappear by just shutting off some sort of system. Yeah. Oh yeah. I did. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Mark, thank you so much for being here. I hope, uh, I hope more and more people tune on to this subject and really explore it because it's definitely a subject worth exploration. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure.